and we have three excellent presenters who are going to talk about other aspects of the history of Morris College, all of the sessions in one way or another have to do with the history of the college, and certainly next year we will invite others of you to uh, prepare uh, papers to present. Uh, Dr. Meadows, we certainly want something on Morris and education, that's one of the very important areas of the history of the college, and you are doing an excellent job in uh, reactivating some aspect of that, but in a different way. Of course, uh, we, we look forward to other members of the faculty who are here. At any rate, without further delay, uh, because we are a little bit behind our schedule, we will now uh, have our second session with uh, Dr. Dunn, Mr. Hammett, and Mr. Bailey, who will present in the order that they are uh, on the program. Uh, Dr. Dunn. Okay, so hello, good morning, everyone, or should I say good early afternoon? Oh. Oh. So greetings, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for coming out in the um, rainstorm. <laughs> that was caught me by surprise, to say the least. Um, I want to um, preface my uh, comments by saying that one of the things that um, I'm interested in and that I'm uh, working on right now are is digging through some of the history of women um, in relationship to uh, Morehouse, um, hence the title um, that I uh, came up with um, um, for this talk today. Um, some of them were men, um, some of them were Morehouse men, and yes, some of them were even women. So. Um, so what I'm interested in is the ways in which this college, um, which is of course grounded in the edu education of black men, has also been a collaborative work. Um, not just men's work, but um, a development that has been very much impacted and influenced and informed by the service of women. Okay? Um, and one of the things that uh, there's several things, and, and uh, one of the three things that I want to sort of um, uh, structure my my um, my um, brief uh, talk about is that one. One of the reasons why the history of women's role in helping to build and to develop and to define even the Morehouse mystique, I would go so far as to say, is that of course many of these women that we would speak of are defined solely in their roles as the, the spouses of um, the men who defined Morehouse. And so therefore, um, their intellectuality, their spirituality, and their commitments to service has often been very obscured, although these she roles, I would argue, I would go so far as to argue, do not and did not merely serve as the helpmates um, of the men. Right? They were not just the, um, the trophy wise, neither were they women who merely hosted social activities in their roles as president's wives, as the first ladies of the college, as faculty in the various departments at Morehouse, but they were often, as we find in the civil rights movements and movements before, the agitators, uh, the ones who impacted, influenced, and, and sometimes I'm sure did a little bit of kicking butt to get men um, to do the work that they saw was critical to uplifting the race. So I want to um, suggest that more than just um, the spouses of, right, who were doing work that merely supported their husbands, many of them were already prominent women in their own right, well-educated, committed to service, social activists, these are women that were in the vein of the Mary McLeod Bethunes and the Ida B. Wells. These women who touched Morehouse and who influenced their um, men, as even um, um, the late great Benjamin Mays would say of um, Mrs. Mays, right? Who even came up with the title, I believe, of, of the autobiography. So these women were critical to not only the development, right, of the visionary leadership, right? of their spouses and so forth, but in their own right, they were actually helping to define, you know, I would argue, Morehouse's relationship to service, right? Um, Morehouse's relationship to intellectuality, Morehouse's relationship to spirituality. 
And there are several women that I want to touch upon as women who, to me, modeled um, that. And of course, we can't have this discussion without talking about one Lugenia Burns Hope, who was a she, and I'm asking some of my students out here, who was, who was that fine lady, Lugenia Burns Hope, this one? Yes, sir. Okay. See, right. Thank you so much. So, um, Mrs. Uh, Lugenia Burns Hope, okay, um, was of course the wife of John Hope, the legendary John Hope. She, of course, also um, was the first lady of Morehouse College. But I want to say a little bit more about who she was, okay. Um, not only was she a social activist and a woman who was um, very, very, very active in the promotions of, of you know, women's causes and, of, and particularly of the black community, but, but she also was an independent leader in the sense that she was doing many things beyond just the work of First Lady of Morehouse College, et cetera, that impacted the community around Morehouse. And in that vein, I will, I'm arguing that she was one of the key women in those um, early years in the 20th century that really helped to place that emphasis on service to the community as integral to the Morehouse College educational experience. So for example, along with several other women, this Lugenia Burns Hope, this Shiro, formed the Neighborhood Union, okay? She was elected president to this organization, okay? And what this was, what this, this organization was and what it's been written about as is really the model of a grassroots organization, okay? A community building. It was focused on community building, okay? And not only was it an organization that was focused in, on uplifting the community in terms of education, right, for those who were impoverished and those who were, you know, who did not have um, the best access to education and to uplifting the living standards, right, of the community. But she also engaged Morehouse students in the process. So she helped Morehouse students develop some, their early commitment to service by using them to interview, to go out in the community. And their job was to go out into the community and basically interact with the residents, to interview them and find out what are their needs? What are their lives like? What could they do as Morehouse men and as Morehouse College and as part of this neighborhood union, right, to uplift the community around them? So she sent Morehouse students out um, to do this work, to basically do research, right, to do field work, okay? Um, and, and she did this because she was trying to address issues of lack of education, uh, sanitary issues in, in homes, particularly in the um, impoverished community, dental care, social activity. It was very broad and wide reaching. Under her leadership, um, which, she, which, she, which she held for studying um, from 1908 to 1935, right, um, she demanded better conditions at the schools, because remember at this time, we're talking about before some of the first actual public schools were even established that African Americans could even attend, right? And early on, it was tough going to um, have quality, the rare quality public school that actually provided African American students with proper materials and even with a proper learning environment. So often they were, you know, being educated in conditions that weren't more, much different from what we would expect coming out of slavery. Okay. So she was head of this till 1935. They cleaned up, as um, um, some of the sources call it, some of the African American districts. Now, I will have to say that, of course, it's been well noted that African American women who were involved in doing the work of uplifting the community um, had as some of their concerns, right, the moral integrity, the moral fiber of African American women and of the community at large. 
So they were on the attack and on the agenda about what they saw as disreputable, right, influences in the community, whether that was gambling or, you know, drinking. So in other words, you don't want to really meet Lugenia Burns, Hope, and her crew, <laughs> right, when you were doing wrong and, un and not and influencing youth um, away from education and, and moral and religious living, right? So that was all encompassing the work that she was doing, okay? She's been, she was called headstrong and demanding. Hardly a passive helpmeet, even of a legendary man like John Hope. She also became a special war work secretary during World War I, right? And organized services that brought together black and Jewish soldiers. Helped to train other African American women and help in the the, uh, the development of the YWCA, right? Which she saw as an important um, institution to help do the work of uplift, but also to help the many Black folk who were migrating from South to North to adjust to urban life and to also um, have better living conditions and better educational opportunities. Um, she went on and was was appointed to Herbert Hoover's. Colored Advisory Commission, okay, um, which worked with the, the American National Red Cross um, with victims of the flood, the Great Flood of 1927. And she became, in 1932, the first vice president of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in Atlanta, the Atlanta chapter, okay. Um, and even after um, Mr. Uh, President Hope uh, passed away in 36, she continued to be active, moving to New York, working with Mary McLone, Beth Mary McLone uh, Bethune, and on the Commission on Interracial Cooperation. Okay? And of course, if you don't know about that committee, you should, because that was one of the committees that was very important, that formed particularly in the aftermath of the 1906 race riot. Everybody heard of that before that happened here in Atlanta? when then um, black business folk and leaders and white business folk and leaders formed a commission that was basically about developing, right, um, cooperative, um, you know, relationships across racial lines. So that's a very important organization, the Commission on Interracial um, Cooperation. The other person that I want to mention br briefly um, is one who I um, am uh, working on doing um, some writing on um, now. And I find her fascinating because there's so little said about her. But I think that she is representative of this, the truly brilliant black women yes. who had all of this major impact on some of the people that, you know, whose her ashes are, lie here on Morehouse College as well as those of her husband. And this is Sue Bailey Thurman. Ever heard of her? Many people have heard of of Sue Bailey Thurman. See, now that's a problem. We got to uncover these sheroes, right? <laughs> Sue Bailey Thurman was the wife of, one last name Thurman. So we can, right, okay. <laughs> but I want to suggest that she was much more than the wife of Howard Thurman. She influenced and impacted, right, some of the principles that, in, that then, of course, he mentored Dr. King in developing the principles of nonviolence and et cetera. Now, how do we know this is true? First of all, she, was, she herself was an advisor to Gandhi. She was an advisor to him yeah. on U.S. affairs. Y'all know that? <laughs> she was, right? Yes. Um, she helped to establish the International Library Museum Centers at six colleges, yeah. okay, and museums of African-American history in many African-American communities. Okay, um, she founded the World Fellowship Committee of the YWCA, and guess what? She was the first editor of Afro American Women's Journal, the first published organ of the National Council of Negro Women. Okay, so she was a woman who wrote extensively, published books. There is not, there is not, and you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go that far with it, but certainly there will be an article on her. Um, no, um, you know, definitive biography of Sue Bailey Thurman, despite obviously her impact on being in some ways the mediator and the shaper of the um, principles um, that you know Thurman was developing and was influencing Gandhi on. But this is just examples of the women that I hope to uncover. 
Because even beyond the fact that we had women students admitted here, as you know, right, from 1929 to 1933, of which the last um, female graduate is still surviving at age 96, I believe she is, Mr. Edwards, so um, this, is, um, this, this is work that is important for you all to study because often, we I want to end with this comment, is that Morehouse College is obviously a collaboration across gender as it is across race and other lines. However, because women have often been noted as the help meet of, of, as the spouse of, right? And because they have been assigned in some ways to roles that were as the secretary of such, sometimes there is an implied inferiority or not the need to discover their intellectuality and their spirituality. And what it does is undermine the impact that they had individually because they're only seen in the light of their husbands, if they're seen at all. Okay. Oh, please. <laughs> okay. If they're seen at all. So um, I just want to end by saying expect more work on this and more conversation about Sue Bailey Thurman and about um, Lugenia Burns Hope. I encourage you that while you're researching the men, also research the women because you won't truly have uncovered the history of Morehouse College if you haven't delved into that collaborative relationship. And I think Nasir Mohammed. Absolutely right, Dr. Dunn. One of the things that we have uh, promised in the new history of the college is to give greater uh, emphasis on the, at least the first ladies, but certainly those women uh, who are also attending the college, uh, several dozen who actually graduated from the hospital. Mr. First of all, it's an honor to be on the hollow grounds of Morehouse College. Um, we definitely appreciate what Dr. Dunn uh, stated in terms of the women. Some of what she said I'll probably touch on because I saw very few hands raised when she mentioned 1906 race riots. Um, but I will cover, and it won't be long, I'm going to point out significant uh, times in Morehouse history that you may not be aware of that were uh, phenomenal during the time frame of when it, which it happened. And it's actually from Dr. John Hope up into the death of Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So I'll begin by saying this. <clears throat> Dr. John Hope is probably one of the uh, forgotten heroes in terms of education, impact, education, not just in America, America, but in the world in terms of what he was able to do at Morehouse College. If you know anything about his history or if you went through any of his history, you know before he became the president, he was actually a professor. Dr. John Hope came out of tradition of radical Republicans, blacks who had came from Reconstruction. One of his mentors was Reverend Dwelle. If you don't know who Reverend Dwelle is, D-W-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, you certainly need to do some research on him because he was as big as Dr. King is today during that time as a pastor. And of course, he died here in Atlanta at, a, at an old age. And he, of course, he was, a, he was the uh, uh, the reverend of the church uh, where Morehouse began in Augusta. But he was a mentor to Dr. John Hope. And a lot of the attitudes and disposition about what was going to take place as it relates to speaking out and pushing for liberal arts education, it actually began in, that, in those conversations in Augusta. When Dr. Hope becomes a uh, professor at Morehouse, he was actually not just a professor go along to get along. He was an agitated, an agitator type of professor. So one of the individuals that he had a strong relationship is a person who also doesn't get a lot of credit in terms of history. And you should study him too, William Monroe Trotter. William Monroe Trotter, Dr. John Hope, W.E.B. Du Bois, and those who were actively involved in the Niagara movement if you just go and read their works in the early stages, you'll begin to see how this idea and what he pushed, I mean, it's phenomenal in the sense that Morehouse decides to make him the president, although it was a calculated risk because Dr. Hope, who didn't attend the July 1905 meeting that took place, the first meeting that took place uh, 
for, to set up the Niagara Movement, he actually went to the one in 1906. A lot of people don't talk about the 1906 one because John Brown was revered at the 1906 one. Check this out. At the 1906 summit at Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, Dr. Hope, of course, in his, in his uh, papers, which is at the Atlanta University Center, he emphasized he was the only president of, quote unquote, our college, colleges amongst the group. Hope's militant intentions were announced dramatically during his first summer as president of Atlanta Baptist College, with his participation in the second meeting uh, of the Radical Niagara Movement. The meeting took place, of course, at Harpers Ferry the Historic Store College, a mission established by the American Missionary Association after the Civil War. For four days, from August 15th to 19th, the 100 participants, mostly blacks, with a sprinkling of a few northern whites, rededicated themselves to the principle of full equality. A high level conference for Dr. Hope, and he said this in his papers, occurred one day at, the, at dawn when he joined others in a barefoot pilgrimage to the restored site of John Brown's famous 1859 raid on the federal arsenal. In Dr. Hope's papers, he talks about this being, you know, a thing that really stood out in terms of that. Now, the reason why this is important, because you have to put everything in context of history. Dr. Hope becomes the president of Morehouse. Within a few days of time frame, as he comes to Morehouse and classes are getting ready to begin, guess what happens in Atlanta? September 1906, Atlanta Massacre, which is called the Atlanta Race Riots. Uh, due to his radical views, Dr. John Hope radical views, Dr. Dunn mentioned that his wife was involved in the Interracial Race Commission that was established to deal with, um, you know, making sure that 1906 race riots never happened again because African Americans were armed and they fought back. But they wanted to make sure that the races began to work together. But this didn't happen for Dr. Hope and his wife until the 19-teens. But in 1906, Dr. Hope was not, he was the president of Morehouse. He wasn't even invited to the August body of people trying to strategize and moving Atlanta forward. Why? Because of his radical views. He seemed convinced, Dr. Hope, that the organizers of the interracial meetings initially with selected African-American leaders, businessmen, members of city council and school board and representatives from the mayor's office and police department, of course, the white establishment, were more concerned with Atlanta's image than with genuine prog progressive change. He completely rejected the official explanation of the riots dispatched to the world and was not convinced that the apologies were sincere. In a letter written to his friend, W.T.B. Williams, early in October, which that paperwork is at the Atlanta University as well, Dr. Hope wrote, Atlanta is badly disfigured and full of apologies, but explanations do not explain, if you will, pardon the paradox. And that's in, of course, the book that deals with Dr. John Hope. This is important because this didn't happen in a vacuum. In 1895, when Booker T. Washington came to Atlanta and spoke at the Cotton Exposition, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois sent a telegram to uh, Washington stating how well and how he appreciated what he had given at, the, at Piedmont Park. Dr. John Hope, with him and Trotter, were two of the most vicious in terms of attacking everything <laughs> that Washington said at Piedmont Park at the Exposition. So Dr. Hope was a, I mean, radical in terms of his ideas, in terms of the liberal arts education and where African Americans should be going. Now, of course, later on, and you'll get this probably, uh, certainly we'll get it in, in the research that's being done, a lot of things begin to change when you reach into the teens and the 20s and Dr. Hope in terms of working with Booker T. Washington. But the early phases of this in Atlanta is very important because in Atlanta's history, you have no markers indicating where the 1906 race riots took place. You have no mention of Morehouse relationship once this took place. So Morehouse has been involved in several different things in the local history of Atlanta. And there has not been any event that, has, that was you know, of a huge magnitude in Atlanta that Morehouse was not involved in. Another case in point, sorry for speaking so fast, but it's just a lot of good information. Um, a Morehouse graduate, Dr. Mordecai Johnson, and it, he's so significant and important to the history of Morehouse because as a Morehouse son, he was one of those students that came from under the umbrella of the leadership of Dr. Hope. Now he goes and becomes, in 1926, the first black president of Howard University. 
This is so important because he served 34 years until he retired in 1960. And of course, the legendary Dr. Benjamin Mays was there at the school, at the school as the, uh, Mays was the uh, dean of the University School of Religion. When Dr. Mordecai, and, and even when I read this to you what Dr. May said in do, delivering the eulogy, this just helps you understand the magnitude of, of, and the influence that Dr. Mordecai, a Morehouse man, who was the embodiment, embodiment of that Morehouse mystique that is always talked about. Uh, Dr. Mays, <clears throat> no man in the 20th century has spoken more eloquently against racism, segregation, and denigration than Mordecai Johnson. No man in this century spoke more forcefully against German, German Nazis, Italian fascism, and Soviet communism than Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, demonstrating that when a man speaks the truth, supported by ethical and moral living, girded with deep spirituality, nothing can stop him except illness and death. Mordecai believed as Shakespeare, thrice is he armed who has, he, <clears throat> excuse me, thrice is he armed who has his quarrels just, and that God will sustain that which is right. And that's the eulogy that was done September 10th, 1976. If you do anything, read that, the eulogies that Dr. Mays did for Mordecai, uh, Dr. Colossal, Hubert, Charles Hubert, and the one he did for Dr. King. Those three eulogies touch on a lot of, I mean, deep, deep embedded stuff about Morehouse and what it truly represents and the men who, who were um, a part of that. Now, the friendship of Dr. Mays and Dr. Johnson exceeded 50 years. So these men, brilliant African-American leaders, uh, were instrumental in developing men across this country. And those men, of course, went into the world and influenced hundreds and thousands of young men and women throughout the country. Another point that uh, I will say, and this, and this is my last point, because this, this, this event that happened at Morehouse is huge. President Benjamin May says in his book uh, that he was, never, he was always committed to true freedom and he never wavered in that commitment. He wanted to bring, to, he wanted to bring people to Morehouse College who shared his vision of freedom and justice for mankind. And one of those people who was very controversial in 1943 is Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson, the singer, actor, phenomenal, phenomenal. And, and he's really you know, a forgotten hero in the African-American experience. He was brought to Morehouse. He had never received an a, a, a honorary uh, degree from any black college in the country. Matter of fact, he was persona non grata in America and abroad in 1943. He was labeled a communist. I mean, you didn't want to take a picture and be anywhere near Paul Robeson in 1943. But the man that embraced him, and this was the first time that Paul Robeson came as far as the Mason-Dixon line when he came to Morehouse, uh, June 2nd, 1943. We almost celebrating 70 years of this experience. Rosen was a singer, actor, civil rights actress, and a former All-American football player who graduated from Rutgers University. He had traveled around the world and was criticized by many for his unyielding stance on racial equality. He was not welcome in southern hotels, and some in the north as well, because of his views and activism. But he was free to speak and fraternize at Morehouse College on the Red Clay Hill in Atlanta, Georgia, with his atmosphere of freedom which permeated even, in, even its walls and halls. On June 2nd, 1943, Paul Robeson was the commencement speaker at Morehouse and received the honorary degree of Humane Letters. In recognition of his, of his exemplary achievements, in his, in his remarks, as he awarded the honorary degree, this is what Dr. Mays stated. You have had the courage to dignify and popularize, popularize folk songs of the oppressed peoples of the earth. You have proved that you have a mission in song and a deep abiding faith in that mission. In singing, you champion the cause of the common man. You represent in your person, in your integrity, and in your ideals, the things for which this college stands for and for which it shall continue to stand. We are happy to be the first Negro college in the world to place its stamp of approval upon the leadership of a man who embodies all the hopes and aspirations of the Negro race 
and who despite crippling restrictions, breathe the pure air of freedom, Dr. Benjamin Mays. In response, Robeson asserted, Dr. Mays, I am honored upon receiving a degree from a Negro institution and whose graduates have distinguished themselves in various fields. After that, Paul Robeson sang some of his folk songs and the large crowd, the large crowd responded with huge applause for him. In Born to Rebel, the autobiography of Dr. Mays, he talks about Paul Robeson in there. And it's just, un, it's just so magnificent that during this time frame, 1943, when no, I mean, the US government and foreign nations didn't want to have anything to do with Paul Robeson, he was honored at the, on the hollow grounds of Morehouse College. I conclude by saying that these experiences and things that have taken place at Morehouse uh, it's not, they didn't happen in a vacuum, and it's not the first. Benjamin Davis, uh, another Morehouse graduate, and his father, who was first black newspaper in Atlanta. Morehouse never turned it back on its students, its graduates, even if their idea or ideals were in contrast. It wasn't about everybody being fit in one thing. Dr. Mays, the unique thing about him is that he was so consistent. I mean, if you just take him from his beginning, to the end, he was so consistent with his appeal for and pushing for the advancement of African Americans. Even when it wasn't popular, Dr. Mays stood on his ground. And, and even when Dr. King was just like Paul Robeson, persona non grata, Dr. Mays stayed steadfast in understanding that the, the people, the community, and all of them is what Morehouse is here to serve. They're here to gain that knowledge and wisdom and understanding and go out and render that service. So, those are aspects of Atlanta history that are not, you're not gonna find them on monuments, you're not gonna find them even in Atlanta's history. You go to Atlanta History Center and those repositories, it has nothing about Morehouse in the establishment of Atlanta into the quote unquote, the city too busy to hate in the Great Gate City. But Morehouse played a role on all of that and it still continues to even today. Thank you. Thank you. We will have several books published uh, when we celebrate our assessment centennial. One is the American History and Writing, but we will also have an anthology. And some of the presentations you'll hear today, uh, I think the ones that we have heard on this panel and before, will be included in that anthology. And this gives you different perspectives. And some of your papers suggest that we've been activists for a long time in Mars, not just for Dr. King. Um, either recognizing activism or being activists themselves. And I think it's very interesting that we have that scholarship. Now we're going to a period or a time when there was this public activism. I think most people know about or have heard about what happened in 1969. And uh, Ms. Bay is now going to talk about this. Good morning. My name is Tristan Bailey. I'm Dr. Barsley. My paper would deal with activism, but activism that was more radical. On April 18, 1969, Morehouse College students staged a protest by holding the Board of Trustees hostage for over 29 hours. This incident coincided with protests on several college campuses around the country. In 1969, African American students were challenging the status quo of their institutions. This was a time of great social change in America. The Black Power Movement was at its zenith, and Americans were still dealing with the aftermath of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr which occurred one year earlier. Although the Morehouse College protests of 1969 can be viewed as a part of the activist culture of the 1960s, it was not the first time in the history of the school that Morehouse students challenged the dynamics of the institution. In the early 20th century, during the New Negro Movement, students of Morehouse College found some of the rules and regulations of the institution problematic and expressed their grievances in a civil manner. Unlike their predecessors from decades earlier, the students involved in the latter protest took a more radical approach to bring about change. The, this essay examines the factors that led to the Morehouse College student protest of 1969, the reactions from the Morehouse community, and its significance. One could argue that the Morehouse student protest of 1969 can be attributed to the newfound consciousness of African Americans that developed during the Black Power Movement. 
This type of consciousness was also spread among African Americans during the new Negro movement of the early 20th century. During the new Negro movement, black college students found ways to alter their curricula, their administrations, and their living arrangements. This national tendency of the new Negro movement manifested itself in a push for black studies, or at least courses dealing with African American history. In some cases, there was a strong desire for increased black control of predominantly black institutions that had been administered by whites. In 1917, Morehouse College students staged a four-day strike against mandatory attendance at study hall and the prohibition of evening study in the dormitory rooms. Morehouse College and other schools of the Atlanta University Center became hostile environments for many students during the late 1960s. A couple of incidents occurred around Morehouse College that either incited fury among the students or simply encouraged them to take part in the act activism of their particular era. In February 1968, a large body of students staged a march to the office of the president, Dr. Hugh M. Gloucester, seeking action on a list of complaints. In a five-page release issued to the president, faculty, and members of the administrative staff, complaints were listed in the critical areas of the faculty, personnel and guidance department, the dean's office, registrar's office, the bursar's office, and even the students themselves. In the latter part of 1968, on November 6, certain Morehouse students allegedly physically removed a white female teacher from a classroom at Spelman College for calling the student, a female student, a jackass. Since the record showed that the teacher provoked the incident, no disciplinary action was taken against the Morehouse students. In the first week of April 1969, Morehouse students began to take steps toward confronting the administrators of the school. A number of students set up a tent near the administration building, Harkness Hall, and said that they would hold a vigil until the name of the Atlanta University Center was changed to King University. The students began to write Dr. Martin Luther King University in black paint on the entrance to the schools and on sidewalk walls. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is undoubtedly the most famous and most influential graduate of Morehouse College. The confrontation between students and administrators finally materialized during the third week of April 1969. A group of students demanded a hearing at the scheduled meeting with the Atlanta University Board of Trustees on, April, on Thursday, April 17th, but received no invitation. On April 18th, students from several Atlanta University Center institutions returned to the administration building on the Morehouse campus only to discover that the meeting was for the Morehouse trustees only. Determined to demand a hearing, the students swiftly moved inside the conference room and chained the, the door shut from the inside. The group consisted of four students from Spelman College, three from Morehouse College, and one each from Clark College and Morris Brown College. The group called themselves the Concerned Students, but they were called the McWhorter Group by school officials because they were led by a Spelman College professor named Gerald McWhorter. Mm -hmm. During the lock-in, the militant group demanded that the name of the six institutions of the Atlanta University Center be changed to the Martin Luther King Jr. University, that the Morehouse Board endorsed the consolidation of the six institutions into one university and recommend this action to the other boards of the Atlanta University Center, and that white board members yield their positions to blacks. One of the students who were a part of the McWhorter group was a Morehouse freshman named Lance Hunter. In a loud, mad, and violent voice, Hunter stated, we have renamed this university the Martin Luther King Jr. University Center. We demand the resignations of all the white board members so we can proceed to form a black university. Dr. King Sr. represents the past, a dying age. These hunkies on the trustee board do not even know their function. The time for white control of this black university is over. Cut out the bullshit. The McWhorter group took turns in insulting the trustees using obscene language, demanding that all white trustees sign a resignation form that was handed to them. The imprisoned trustees included Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, President Emeritus of Morehouse College, Dr. Martin Luther King Sr., Dr. Hugh M. Gloucester, who was the president of Morehouse College at that particular time, and several others. Dr. Gloucester was so overwhelmed by the takeover that he threatened to resign. He stated, since I cannot be a party to concessions made under duress to a group of 10 individuals, I am herewith submitting my resignation of Morehouse College. Outside the conference room, more students seized and occupied the administration building. 
detained and imprisoned school officials and other students, broke into and took over the office of the president, damaged school property, placed unauthorized long distance phone calls, and made unauthorized use of school supplies. This type of action was not exclusive to Morehouse College during the spring of 1969. As stated previously, the black power movement was at its zenith. African American students were protesting on several college campuses around the country. On the same weekend of the Morehouse takeover, African American students at Cornell University flaunted rifles and shotguns in order to pressure the administration to make concessions. In the following week, a group of black militants took over a faculty building at Colgate University. They barricaded themselves inside Mary House to back their demands for a black cultural center. At Harvard University, about 150 students marched to the planning office in Harvard Square to protest the university's plans to expand into the surrounding neighborhoods. At Princeton University, campus radicals threatened to disrupt the annual dress parade of the Reserve Officers Training Corps. These are just a few of the protests that were taking place on college campuses during that time. After 29 and a half hours, the, Mo the Morehouse lock-in had finally come to an end. On the afternoon of Saturday, April 19, 1969, the trustees were released after it was agree agreed that they accept two of several pr proposals made by the concerned students, including the restructuring of the board to include more black members and that their terms of office be limited to two years. In addition to those two proposals, nine proposals made by the Student Government Association were agreed, agreed upon by the trustees just before their release, making a total of 11 concessions. At a follow-up meeting, Academic Dean Ralph Lee met with the Morehouse student body to discuss their feelings and positions on the entire hostage situation. It was then that the student body rejected all of the concessions on the basis that the trustees were acting under duress. Consequently, the latter meeting nullified the board's concessions, leaving matters officially unchanged. Dr. Hugh Gloucester, who earlier stated that he was quitting his post while held inside the conference room, said his decision to resign was based on the fact that he could not deal with signing any document or voting on any motion presented when his office had been broken into and occupied by students. Gloucester's resignation was rejected by both the student body and the board of trustees. This was an indication of how some individuals of the Morehouse community felt about the lock-in. Alvin Darden, the current Morehouse Dean of the freshman class, was a freshman during the spring of 1969 and a classmate of Lance Hunter. Darden described Hunter as a light-skinned young man with straight hair who was only trying to assert his blackness. Darden believed that the militants were naive youngsters caught up in the black power hysteria who had no particular agenda. He felt that it was despicable for the militants to det detain Dr. King Sr. Dr. King Sr. was a man with a heart condition who had buried his son a year earlier. Darden claims that Gerald McWhorter and his followers were simply trying to make a name for themselves. While the trustees were being detained, Nelson Taylor, who was the president of the Student Government Association, stated, we will oppose you. We will oppose you and let God decide the consequences. He also claimed that some of the students who participated in the barricading of Harkness Hall were sincere and were helping with construction change. But he believed that, that there were others involved in the seizure whose primary purpose was, dis was destruction and the building of confusion. But there were some individuals whose, uh, whose opinions did not concur with Taylor's. Earl Nero, the current, executive, the, the current executive director of the Morehouse College Alumni Association was also a freshman during the spring of 1969. He felt that it was encouraging to see young black people taking a risk to bring about change. Nero believes that the militants brought up some important issues and he has always been in favor of consolidating the schools of the Atlanta University Center. Nero claims that, that the lock-in forced the Morehouse administration to face issues that it had long been afraid to deal with. The opinions of Earl Nero are similar to those of Dr. Tobe Johnson, professor of political science. Dr. Tobe Johnson has been a member of the Morehouse faculty since the 1960s. Although Dr. Johnson was surprised by the actions of the militants, he empathized with them. Dr. Johnson believes that the lock-in helped to bring about concrete changes to Morehouse, such as the implementing of black studies and changes in the academic calendar, such as ending this fall semester in December and discontinuing Saturday classes. However, Nelson Taylor's sentiments were shared by Dr. Calvin Brown, Jr., 
who presided over the Morehouse Alumni Association in 1969. Dr. Brown urged the college's board of trustees to take firm dis disciplinary action against the milita militants who locked the trustees in the administration building for over 29 hours. He also joined the Morehouse student body and trustees in asking Dr. Hugh Glosser to reconsider his resignation as president of the college. Dr. Brown st stated, should Dr. Glosser's resignation remain in effect and should the students remain undisciplined, it would shake the very foundation of the institution. Dr. Brown's wish for Dr. Hugh Glosser to remain at Morehouse was granted. Dr. Glosser said that the effective date of the resignation that he submitted to the trustees during the lock-in had to be agreed upon by himself and the trustees, and he stated that could be any time, 1990. He also cited a code of the Georgia law which could nullify any agreement arrived at between two parties when one was subjected, subjected to threats or coercion by the other. Dr. Gloucester didn't retire from the president of Morehouse College until 1987, almost two decades after the lock-in. Dr. Brown's desire for the disciplining of the militants also came to pass. As a result of their participation in the lock-in, 28 Morehouse students were disciplined after hearings held on May 28th and 30th by the advisory committee, a faculty student board which handles disciplinary problems at Morehouse College. After all petitions by some of those who were disciplined, 13 students were dismissed, six were suspended for one semester, five were suspended for two semesters, and four were placed on strict probation. It appeared that the majority of the public supported the disciplinary action taken by the advisory committee. Newspapers generally took a favorable view, and several people sent messages of endorsement. The Morehouse faculty went on record against the humiliations, insults, and terror tactics committed by the militants and recommend, recommended that the advisory committee take any dis disciplinary action it deemed necessary and proper. The Alumni Association also protested against concessions made under in intense pressure and under duress. On the other hand, arguments in favor of amnesty came from several sources, including the disciplined students themselves. A group of 20 alumni petitioners and a columnist with the local African-American newspaper. Although the lock-in was considered unnecessary by some individuals, it definitely helped to bring improvements to Morehouse College because it called attention to concerns of many students. At a meeting in New York on May 13, 1969, the Morehouse Board of Trustees accepted six of eight proposals presented to them by the members of the Morehouse Student Government Association. The board chose not to vote on proposal number H, which would have given amnesty to all students involved in the confrontation at Harkness Hall. The board overwhelmingly voted to accept proposal number six, which calls for an increase in black representation by adding nine new black members. Three of the new members were students elected by the student body, three more were faculty members elected by the faculty, and three were elected by the community at large. Other proposals that were accepted that were accepted called for equal student representat representation on all policy-making committees. After the meeting was over, SGA President-elect Carter Drake stated, the victory by the students today ha has two basic meanings. First, it means that, that students and administrators can sit down at the conference table and ne negotiate change for the betterment of academic institution. Second, it means that demanding and lock-in tactics are not always necessary. In the fall of 1969, changes were also made to the Morehouse curriculum. On the weekend of September 6 and 7, the faculty held a retreat, a retreat at Stone Mountain Inn for the purpose of discussing curricular reforms recommended by a faculty student committee that had been working during the summer. One major change was the faculty approval of an Afro-American studies concentration. This concentration was equivalent to a, ma a minor for majors in departments in the di divisions of the humanities and social si sciences. The aforementioned Dr. Tobe Johnson was the appointed director of that program. Moreover, the college received a Title III government grant for a critical languages program, which provided courses in Igbo and Swahili, as well as Chinese and Russian. In addition, Atlanta University Center students were permitted to register for, summer for seminars offered by five senior research fellows in the Institute of the Black World, which at that time was a component of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Center. The Morehouse student protest of 1969 was a turning point in the history of the college. Although the militants were criticized and received severe 
punishments, several am amendments to the college can be attributed to their actions. It is because of those amendments that this controversial event is worth studying. sit down and relax and enjoy his retirement after so much great work that had been accomplished. He didn't. He actually got involved in the public education in Atlanta because it was horrendous. Had he not got involved in the public education of Atlanta, you talk about the scandal that was going on now, that, has, that ain't nothing compared to what was going on when Dr. Mays first got on the, you know, the Board of Education. So his he didn't teach the students, and his aspect at Morehouse was not, and Morehouse Institution itself was not that you go, you do this, you do that. No, Dr. Mays was in the forefront. And when students were arrested, that's why, you know, I know Herman Cain was here recently. I hate I missed it because I wanted, I had a question for him because, Dr. If you're a Mays man, you have to recognize that Dr. Mays 
was down there when the students were being, you know, let out. They was arrested. A perfect example is the, Sp the Spelman young lady, uh, Ruby Doris Robinson Smith. Dr. Mays was right there. Dr. Mays was right there and pushing and encouraging and moving the students and not, you know, sitting on the sidelines. So that part of it, I think, is all encompasses what Morehouse traditionally have done. And sorry to be so long. Now, and I would just say briefly that I think what Morehouse models through Mays, but even before him through yeah. Hope and, um, you know, and Virginia Burns Hope and Mrs. Gloucester, who's also another phenomenal <laughs> hero, yes. is that you can uphold the moral ethics, which means the commitment to um, black progress and advancement to human rights, yes. um, et cetera, and not compromise on those. So for example, it's not that anybody can come and be engaged at Morehouse College, right? But Morehouse had a number of folk who were controversial on the world stage, including very recently with Mugabe and, I'm, yes. and, and being one of the colleges, if I'm correct, yes. that still hasn't rescinded yes. the honorary degree that he gave. I mean, this is, and recently, just the other night, we, we you know, um, and Mr. Booker is here, uh, Ms. Terrell Booker, who, who brought him here, who organized that and reached out to him, um, brought um, Brother uh, Herman uh, Cain. Um, now, I don't agree with his politics, right. but it's very important right. for that gentleman to have been invited here and for that conversation to happen. It should have happened months ago when he was actually running for president, quite frankly, mm -hmm. because it's important in, in, in the fact they gave students the opportunity who did not agree with, the, with, uh, with his politics or those of the, the, the right wing, or they were very classy and very intelligent and in posing questions, but also in listening to him. I, I learned something and didn't agree with a lot, but still learned something. And I think this is something that is often lost in a conservative, uh, sometimes a too conservative era where money, politics, and so forth often legislate how radical we can be just, just in inviting folk and engaging people who represent the diversity of black folk. In another, 1917, which most people think the only time Garvey ever came to Atlanta was oh. when he was incarcerated. 1917, Marcus Garvey spoke at uh, Beth, Big Bethel AME Church. Packed audience, blacks, whites, college students, Dr. Hope, I mean, packed house. And it was, of course, the, the opportunity for him was laid to do the 38 city tour coming out of uh, Jamaica by, of course, Booker T. Washington. But the African-American community embraced the idea of being able to engage the individual. And Dr. Hope, I mean, Dr. Mays, in his autobiography, Born to Rebel, he talks about the influence that Garvey had on black people and how phenomenal that was. And a Morehouse man ends up being the right-hand man for Marcus Garvey. So it's unique that the that Morehouse was that, 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 that central station for black men to emerge and, and, and get involved in movements from all different aspects without having to compromise who and what they truly represent as Morehouse, Morehouse men. I think what we're hearing is that the activism, the black struggle for freedom is not uh, in the one group, it's very diverse. Yes. It doesn't follow one path, you can be military without having certain trappings variety of ways that yeah. we can protest the oppression of African Yes, Dr. Let me just uh, ask you for any of you, maybe a lot of you will talk this, but it's sort of like interesting because even as a Morehouse graduate, I, my, my understanding is we have always been very conservative, <coughs> large, large uh, parts, political status quo, and you know, we've been somewhat, you know, socioeconomic, you know, the philanthropic organizations, a white establishment, so to speak. And uh, so this is sort of like very new for me. But I remember, I don't think it's a rumor, but I was told as a student here that um, Malcolm X actually had come on this campus and Richard Hughes was not quote unquote welcome. I don't know if you came across any of that in your um, reading. I have came across the reading when he was at Atlanta University, but not Morehouse College. Now, uh, Morehouse did have uh, Dr. Donnie Makwa, and Morehouse had, uh, well, no, Atlanta University had the, uh, I don't know if you know him, but uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Shabazz, Dr. I'm sorry, Lonnie Shabazz, but his, he hasn't, of course, I forget Dr. Shabazz's name, Islamic name now, but Dr. Shabazz 
was the, he's produced more blacks with PhDs in mathematics than anybody in the country. And he's now, of course, I think he's at uh, Tuskegee or one of the schools, I forget. But what happened was Dr. Shabab was very, very active in the African American community. Now, Morehouse students were engaged with Dr. Shabazz. Dr. Lonnie Shabazz's home, right here, close to the AU Center, the Ku Klux Klan, because Dr. Shabazz was the Muslim leader in the community here, they marched onto his property, and they actually put a cross and burned it in the yard. And the Morehouse students, the AU Center students, went to Dr. Shabazz's uh, home and helped to protect and defend it. I don't know if they had guns. I don't know if they just went with their body. But this is not, there's nothing unique about that. Because in 1930, right here, on the, right here next to the Morehouse campus, uh, Dr. Colossal, Charles Huber, was attacked at his home after they killed another Morehouse man in the Pittsburgh community. The Ku Klux Klan, members of the Ku Klux Klan, came, bust out their lights on Sisters Chapel, right on the campus here, and marched right down the street, close to where the president residence is, and went into the home and tried to take Dr. Hubert out of there so that they could kill him. The community, because at that time, Morehouse uh, administrators lived right in the community here. They actually heard the uprising and they went out and ran them out of the community. So the, you know, those things are not, of course, now they will be, <laughs> you know, but a lot of history has not, you know, history has been forgotten in terms of Morehouse and how those students have been involved in, you know, in terms of the community. but. Uh, I don't know if Malcolm ever came here, but I know he's at Atlanta University. Yeah, but the, the history of activism in the Morehouse is controversial, as yes. you pointed out. And certainly, yeah. I think yeah. this yeah. man was telling us it is true, but it is kind of checkered. Yes. Uh, the extent to which Dr. May is really supporting the students. Yes. He talked about it. He was there. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Dr. Marks is a very nice place. He's doing things to alienate the stream of cash or money that did not come. That he wanted to come. So, you know, these, these provocative. Yes, very, very. Yes. Yes. Dr. Oxley, the reason I brought that up is because uh, I am a community activist, as you well know, and I'm hearing um, that Morehouse isolates itself from the surrounding area. I don't find that to be true in anything that I've heard or in the literature, but it surely yes. seems to be. Well, one of the things we have to be mindful of uh, is that when people who are from an institution participate in something. Are they representing the institution or themselves? So that we often talk about the black church being so involved in the civil rights movement. That has been debunked. Some black churches, <laughs> yes. and of course some members from black churches, but <laughs> if you're going to say Morehouse is involved, then did this come from some meeting they had where they said, we are, as Morehouse, going to do this? Or was it people from Morehouse, you know, who did it? We have to really wait. Mr. Brady, what were you going to say something? Okay. But, but you're right. Uh, it, it does warrant the research that Mr. Mohammed is doing. And I think it's very, very important that we get that perspective of radicalism or um, militancy at Morehouse. I guess it the is question that. is, could Atlanta be what it is if Morehouse and Morehouse students didn't do what they do? I just think mm -hmm. that Morehouse shaped Atlanta's success. Yes. Uh, freak make whatever it evolved <laughs> to be, but a lot of things that happened in Atlanta, um, economically, power-wise, our, our mayors, uh, you know, I just think Morehouse had a lot to do with that and could it have been done if some of these students were not willing to step out of the box and just be different than the other schools that we don't hear about. First, the consciousness that you get when you're here, the consciousness you do what you do, and I think that's important. I think that's what Mr. Hammond was speaking to. So that's what happened in 1969. So I said that consciousness was born when I was here. I mean, Venice born early 60s. We didn't do it when we were talking about it. Uh, and, and of course, the erupted exploded in 69. And certainly, I, I hope that it's still going on, that, that it's not dead, that people such as yourself and others, the students who are in the audience, uh, will of course carry forward that legacy of. Uh, Struggle for black freedom. It's, it's not always not in it. Yes, sir. Oh, my other question for Mr. Bailey. Uh, Mr. Bailey? Look, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, looking at the future, do you see any uh, potential uprisings for. Uh, Speak up. Uh, do you see any uh, 
uprisings of potential student revolutions or uh, you know students uh, stressing for change here at the college uh, looking forward and ahead into the future. In the future, will that be you see a potential 1969? At this point, no, I don't. 20 years after 69, there was one. Milder than 69. Yeah. But Eddie Glauben spoke here last year from the New College Spring. He challenged the administration last fall, uh, in 1969. 89, 20 years ago. Um, from the stage of King Chapel, made the man, called for the fire, and said, I'm not going around advocating that, you know, you can just go and leave the bed so we need to get to the bar today. But uh, <laughs> the point remains that uh, these things are not something, we talk about training Mohawk men for leadership. And we are challenged to talk about how do we do that? We have a leadership center, a leadership study. And I think that's important that we have it. But most of the people who've emerged as leaders from Mars didn't go for some training. You know, got to think about doing an old report in somebody's class or debating an issue or reading some context, some, some text. So um, I would really think that there might be something down the pike. I, I don't know when. 1969, I don't think they said in 65, in 69, spring of 69, we're going to do what we did. It just reached the point where they couldn't stop anymore. And I think it was part of a larger trend in the country that was they talk about it. You know, if they are doing, see, I don't want to give another lecture, but see, when the students in Atlanta, as uh, Dr. Lee will point out, will, will tell you, we're a little bit late getting in on the direct action city. I think we didn't start doing it until March. Yeah. And it started in February, I think it was about five or six weeks before we finally, we were talking, meeting. When we were, yeah. <laughs> but people would think we immediately rushed out. They were doing it all, I think 15 other schools had already gotten involved in what had happened in Greensboro. We were kind of late, but when we got involved, we got involved in a big way. Uh, but uh, so, you know, when you talk about militancy and more our students, is it more house or is it more house men who are doing it because of their consciousness is raised? So I don't know. What, what the future is. Yes, sir. Wait, I just, if I could briefly ask a question because Thinking back on that last question, there's still a lot of protest, a lot to be, uh, you know, concerned about in the world. We just saw the last couple of years ago, I was next year, the Occupy Wall Street protests. Um, radical inequality, income inequality, wide gap between uh, rich and poor. We saw that as, well, as a United States and also as a global movement. There's still wars going on all over the world. Uh, there's, there's still a significant anti-war. It should have still a significant anti-war sentiment uh, in other parts of the world. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about how class, the notion of class, has affected uh, activism at, the, at Morehouse. It's uh, interesting that when you spoke, uh, man, of the, uh, the role that women have played in creating social change, uh, in the school uh, and in Atlanta, and Atlanta at large, it seems to be bound, if I might make an implication, by kind of a white glove uh, type of activism in which you're trying to change through institutions within a class framework uh, rather than going outside the class. Yeah. Um, there was significant opposition in that, that time period uh, you know, to class inequality, but also against the war. There's anti-war sentiment. Um, Significantly, with respect to the race riot, that was as much a race riot as a class riot yes, um, yes, against yes. the threat of a rising black middle class. Yes. Um, so there, there are class elements to that. I'm wondering if there are class in the, in the notion of class and the rubric of class, whether we've dealt with that, the school has dealt with that, insofar as it can use class, class antagonism, to move on some of these other active issues in the world that need, I think, some activism like. And coming to quality and work. I mean, I think that um, first of all, it has to be waged on that front too, and that that has to be. It, it's it's an intersectional, um, you know, thing. It's gender, it's class, it's sexuality. I mean, these are all the new fronts of which those battles have to be waged simultaneously. And in the history of um, some of the obviously disrest, I mean, even the, if we think of them as racial um, uh, rest, but as you kind of alluded to. 
much of it was um, as much about class as it was race. For example, with the 1906 race riots, right? I mean, it was the black working class and poor folk who, quite frankly, the black bourgeoisie, to be honest, was trying to and hoping that the peace could be kept and that they wouldn't be considered too black and so did the white folk. And when they figured, when they saw that they were all Negroes to those, you know, you know white folk who were out of control, they, um, you know, were, um, they owe some gratitude to the more radical, poor working class black folk who were like taking up arms and prepared to fight it out. No, I can talk now. He's like, you're not supposed to talk yet. It's okay now, Mom, get up. So you, so you see that element there. Fast forward to 1930, even in the case that um, uh, Nasir alluded to, 1930. When the Morehouse student was killed, um, that was Dennis Huber. One of the things that happened is that that case made national news. Um, it, was a, it was a case that upset the city. Um, white citizens took out an editorial um, um, condemning the murder of Dennis Hubert, this innocent um, uh, theological student at Morehouse College. It's, on the, it's in the, a, the Atlanta you know, Journal, which is the front, page, it's the front page of the editorial. There was money raised that was for the support of, re, of rebuilding the family's home that had been burned down, et cetera, et cetera. However, here's the thing. If he had not been a well thought of middle class student with connections, his father was D.J. Johnson, who was a, 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 you know, a very well respected pastor. The family had been now several generations at Morehouse College in Spelman. It would not have happened in that way. The case was reported on in the New York Times. The trials were fo followed. Um, the, you know, there was much attention on the outcome with the six white men, seven white men accused of murdering the Morehouse student be actually acquitted or would they actually do time? Of course, they were sentenced. Whether or not they did time, that's another story to talk about. But a couple years before, a poor student who, who, you know, who had 28 had been murdered. And there was a grand jury did you know, um, come together. But here's the problem. There's hardly any information about that. He was a poor student, um, not well connected. Dennis Huber actually was a driver, drove sometimes for, um, you know, um, Dr. Holt, I mean, who was very well account counted. I mean, he was the, you know, the nephew of who would later on be the interim president of Morehouse. So you see how class was always, in some ways, even in terms of the consciousness, if one was more well off or part of the bourgeoisie, there's a way in which racial violence was then rendered more shocking if it happened where it wasn't supposed to. I think one of the best examples to give is what happened in Montgomery with Clark Coleman yes. and Rosa Parks. Yes. Nothing happened with Claudette. I mean, we now are you know, saving up for, for, for posterity, but there was no big movement that came about as a result. But she did that same year. Right. Right? Was the city. So, so I, I would agree that the black children of Queen Mississippi, the men of the class, that benefited from the board of the masses uh, for all kinds of reasons. Um, of course, I was speaking, as Dr. John is speaking in, in response to your, your the, the question. Is that we didn't riot when Emmett Till was murdered. We didn't right. riot when Becky uh, uh, Evans was murdered in 62. We didn't riot when the four little girls were killed in 16 Baptist Church in the same year, 63. We didn't riot in 65 when Malcolm X. We did in 68. Who could be keen bars? Oh, wow. Well, we rioted then. So, psychologically and, and consciousness, uh, consciousness had been raised so to that we get what we get. And I think that applies to what Mr. Bailey was talking about. In 1969, there was a different level of consciousness among boys than it was when I was in 1969. We had the same agreements as the rest. Didn't do it. It's a talk with them, especially. Just one more. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's be the wrap up the same time. I believe Martin Luther King Jr. made a paraphrase and quote about the world being changed significantly by discipline non conformist. Uh, <coughs> discipline non conformist person who becomes educated, conscious in institutions, um, but understands kind of the rules of the game, um, but educates himself enough to be able to understand where to not conform to create radical change. I'm wondering if, take a look at some of the, the background of some of the folks who've made some of the activism and radical change, whether it were the members of the 60, 1968, maybe some of the new up and coming, uh, you know, Morehouse uh, then, uh, whether that, if you take a look at that as a, as a way to analyze how 
and who uh, the agents of change will be in the future, whether they where we're learning discipline, um, but understanding how discipline disciplining our minds to not conform to injustice uh, as a way to make radical change, rather than to be the undisciplined nonconformists, which seem to be those members of 1968, 69, 69 that perhaps may be a um, focus of analysis. When I, when I think about Dr. King, and you know, you kind of look at the aspect of those conformists and remaining true to the fundamental principles. I think about some of the, I just think about some of the things that Dr. May did, you know, in terms of what he did. And he didn't apologize. When Dr. May made a decision that person was going to be convinced of the speaker, when uh, Representative, let me pull it up, Representative uh, Adam Clayton Powell, who was being butchered and beat up in the 50s by the press, especially white liberals, uh, uh, Adam Clayton Powell came to Morehouse in 1956 as a commencement service speaker. He received an honorary degree. And Dr. May did not make any apologies to the Atlanta Journal, the Atlanta Constitution, and nobody else because he brought him to the institution because he wanted Morehouse men to hear him for themselves. That same spirit that Dr. May did with Adam Clayton Powell, three years before that, or ten years, uh, yeah, ten years before that, he brought Dr. Carter G. Woodson to him. He was a commencement speaker. So that tells you the kind of mindset that Dr. Mays had in terms of not, you know, you're going to have to deal with certain things in the society because you're on your path toward gaining freedom. Everything is not going to happen overnight. That's very difficult for young people to understand. And I didn't, I didn't understand that I was in college. But you, as you begin to mature and grow and develop, you begin to understand that change is possible. It can happen. But you have to be a skilled soldier in this battle. It's not a one-trick pony. Dr. Hey, Dr. May did one more thing, and I'll, I'll get off the horse. In 1945, he brought a man here who definitely, you know, of course, he was a bridge builder and everything, but he stirred the pot, A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph was the commencement speaker right here, and, of course, he was the president of the International Brotherhood of Sleeping Cop Porters, but if you read some of his writing, you already know that, hey, look, I know that the city of Atlanta wasn't pleased to have him Flying, you know, coming into Atlanta and speaking at the commencement service and having the attention of these young African American men, Negroes at that time, of course. And you have to remember that during, the, during that time frame, the African American community and the, even though you have the class system, the class system, the ability to communicate information between those classes was much easier than it is today when someone is in the suburbs and someone is living right next to the campus. So the powder keg that exists among the poor of, in our community, the middle class black folks or the black folks that had a little bit more, they weren't that far off. They weren't that far away from being right in that, in that mode too. That's why in 1906 race riots, when the poor among our people were the ones that had the guns, well, guess how they got them? They got them because of middle class black folks like David T. Howard and others who was in leadership who didn't necessarily, who, who didn't necessarily have the same kind of spirit of the young blacks who were in a poor situation, but they understood that the fact that if you don't protect where you live, then you're gonna be completely wiped out. And Dr. Um, 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 Clark, I'm thinking about him now. I'm picturing him right now. But uh, what he mentioned in terms of if it were not for the poor element that we had criticized on Decatur Street, which Decatur Street was where the dives were that were owned by whites and blacks frequented and all of that, and blacks were used as scapegoats during that riot time. But the, if it were not for the poor, then they would have been decimated. I mean, the whole community would have been decimated because they were the ones that came to the forefront to protect and defend the very thing that we talked about under Booker T. Washington that should be available to us. So I'm, I close up saying that the aspect that poor, middle class, you know, Dr. Mays really was against the label aspect and dealt with the fact that freedom is freedom. We got to get true freedom, and it's not going to come 
through class, not gonna come by looking out this, but Morehouse has to be the training ground for the men to help to guide this energy that exists within that African-American community. And I personally don't think that Morehouse is so far, like, you know, a lot of people think, a lot of people say on the street, it's so far away from that ideal because history doesn't show that it, it's that institution. And I say Morehouse, I always attach those students that were active under, of course, they may not get the orders or the instructions from, you know, but when you come into this, this August body of knowledge, you become a part of that knowledge. So if you carry it out in ways to benefit the community, I give credit to the body of knowledge that actually brought the person. Uh, you mentioned uh, Dr. Daniels, and I think he's a decisive voice in making controversial decisions. Yeah. Near the end of his career, he gave a speech where he said that he could make those difficult and controversial decisions because he had a board of trustees who never second guessed him. Yes. That's yes. important. Yes. He never feared for losing his job. Right. He Absolutely. said they supported him. Yes. Whatever decision he made that was like that, he said he never second guessed him. And Dr. Mayor, the 1967 which, of course, that's uh, the class that Herman Cain graduated. The uh, commencement address that he give, gave there, not only Dr. Bates talked about the success, he really delved into the failures and laid the responsibility, not just on the graduates, not just on uh, the students that were present there and the parents. He laid it on every, I mean, he, he touched everybody, the boards, whites, blacks, and the student, I mean, he touched on everything, and that commencement address is so powerful because he, he felt like, even with all the success, he still felt like he had failed from where he wanted Morehouse to be in terms of where it was. And that's just a profound aspect of Dr. Mays. He talked about success and the failures, and he made it so beautiful to understand where Morehouse should be going in terms of the future. Yeah, I just wanted this very quickly um, because I, you know, what we've been discussing about the stream of consciousness that it's been uneven. It's been uneven, but there has been actually a stream, a stream of radical consciousness that has shown its face at Morehouse. But the problem is that it is at war with a certain level of political correctness um, that is not governed by the best interest necessarily or the agenda agenda of black folk, which is often at odds with what might be the mainstream of the agenda. And so, for example, um, we, we had people like Bobby, we had Aiko Randolph, as he just mentioned, here on this campus, right, as Asante. We have had some giants among, in terms of the world stage, intellectual, et cetera. However, several years ago when I came in, I was still kind of naive, really, or whatever. And this was, and it really recent, I forgot when the, when the film Precious came out. But I had this ideal, I had some connections, so I knew we could make it happen. And since he had been at the AUC Center and he had been touring at black colleges and been at Tuskegee, he'd been in a lot of places, so it wasn't like it was far out. Well, you know the book is, the, 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 the uh, film is based on the novel Push by Sapphire. Well, one of the things that you might not know if, you, if you've never read the book is that the book is very different from the movie that we got, which by and large I think people, black folk had an antipathy to, and it's particularly black men. Well, here's the thing. In the novel, a lot of people don't know that one of the major figures in the novel is Minister Louis Farrakhan. He is Precious's hero. He's, the, he's her one model of, you know, shining black manhood. I mean, there's a poster of him on the wall, and the book even ends with quotes by Minister Farrakhan. She names her son after that. Ain't none of that even indicated by the film that you get. Well, I had this idea that it would be interesting to have this conversation with Minister Farrakhan on this campus, right? You know, and while, they, while Hollywood was celebrating pressures and black folk were like, whoa, right? And have that discussion. And I wanted to have that discussion because also whether b the black bourgeoisie, proper bourgeoisie likes it or not, well, Minister Farrakhan has resonated though with black and working folks, it, it, whether we like it or not, and with hip hop. While we talk at hip hop, Mr. Farrakhan makes a call and Snoop them show up at his house in Chicago. I mean, and, and, and you know, all of these, these, these people, even the popular ones that the little, they'll come when he call and he will have conversation with them at his home. It's happened a number of times. So I thought this would be a very provocative conversation here. Whoa. <laughs> Next leadership is coming from, it's not going to come from the old Jamie Miller class. It has 